Morning everybody, my name is Tom Tate and I'll be filling in for Andrew this week in St Andrew's Blackrock and Bray. I'm no stranger to the area, and particularly to those of you in Bray, having worked in Dunleary as their youth worker for the last seven years. However, this past June I made a move up to Cavan and I'm based uh, here now. It's great to be with you this morning and I'm looking forward to sharing from the book of Luke with you. This is a story that you might know, and it comes from the book of Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. In this story, Jesus arrives in a new town, and as soon as he gets ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Throughout this story, Jesus talks with the demon who calls himself Legion, and they make an agreement that Jesus could drive him into a herd of pigs instead of remaining within this man. This takes place and everyone is shocked to find the man from whom the demon had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his, in his right mind, they were afraid. So they asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. But that's not the end of the story. And it's in these two last verses that I want us to focus today. Because this man, from whom the demons had gone out, begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Within this story of true transformation, it's those last two verses, 38 and 39, which are easily overlooked amid the spectacle that's displayed in the preceding events that we're going to look at. Reading these verses, initially my first thoughts were that Jesus actually doesn't come off all that well. Because is this not what Jesus wants from us? To follow him? In the lead up to this event, we've seen him assembling a very cast of unexpected characters, pulling in fishermen, tax collectors, rebels, calling them all to follow him. And now here we see this man sitting at his feet, begging to come with him. And what does Jesus say? No. This is a desperate man because mere minutes or hours before, he was a social pariah, an object of fear, breaking chains and overpowering guards to run naked among the tombs. And now he faces the prospect of going back, fully intact of faculties to live in that same town. We can only imagine the sideways glances he's going to get, the whispered conversations that are going to follow him on the street. Because once a reputation is formed, it's hard to change. It's easy to see why this man saw an opportunity to escape all that and begged to join Jesus and his followers wherever they were headed. But Jesus doesn't agree. He sends him back to the town saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. This man is sent to be an example of the good work of God in the time from when he came. He is to be a sign of the power and the transformation that's possible on an encounter with Jesus. I have a friend uh, who grew up with a checkered history. He's from South Africa uh, and grew up in the middle of gang life in Durban, South Africa. Throughout his youth, he rose within the gang to be the leader, feared and revered among the community that he grew up, grew up in. Known as a bad guy one to be absolutely feared and avoided. An opportunity came across his path to do a life skills course. And he says he would love to say that he took that place on the course in the hopes of bettering himself. But he and a friend actually enrolled on that course with the hopes of gaining the trust of the leaders in a short time so they could then steal all of the computers in the center so they could sell them. Amazingly, before that, could happen before they could get the trust and steal the computers. The transformational power and message of the gospel reached into the lives of these two convicted gang leaders and they became Christians, thankfully deciding to leave the computers where they were. 
my favorite part of this story is that now, about 20, 25 years later, this guy is now the leader of that same organization, reaching out to thousands of young men and women in South Africa, challenging, challenging them to the hope of better, fuller lives found in Jesus. What an absolute transformation. However, he talks about the years after these events transpired within the community. The years that he spent now transformed a new man, but still an object of fear. People continuing to cross by on the other side of the road when they saw him coming. Because although word was out about his transformation, people didn't believe that it could be true. That this young man could really have changed. It was only through years of openly living that change that he was able to win the trust of that community. Our default position is to be people who need to see something with our own eyes to believe it. Unless we can verify it with our own senses, our hearts stray to doubt so quickly. God himself is not blind to this fact. Time and time again throughout the Bible, he meets people in their doubts. Gideon with the fleece, Thomas with the post-resurrection Jesus, and here in Luke, another example. Jesus leaves this transformed man behind to be a living, breathing testimony of what he has done. This is not intended as a punishment for the demon-possessed man, but a privilege to share the good work of God, the gospel news of the Messiah come in his hometown. Now, I don't know about you, but I am not mistrusted or an outcast from my community, or at least I don't think I am. And maybe neither are you. So you might be asking, what can we learn from this story? But though on the outside, your story and my story may not share many similarities with these ones that we've looked at today. If we have come to know Jesus, each of us has a story of transformation. Each of us knows the transformation that the gospel can bring. And like this man, the temptation for us is to separate our faith lives from the rest of ourselves. Keeping what Jesus has done for us on the quiet may be separate from our everyday lives and communities. Maybe it's out of fear that those around us won't understand, or maybe out of a desire not to offend, or just because owning Jesus and what he's done can be or feel uncomfortable. But our job as believers is to be the aroma of Christ in the world, to show the transformation and the living faith ignited in us. Because it's in those places, within our five kilometer travel limit, like this man within our hometowns, those are the places where we can make a real impact for the gospel. Because it's within those places that people really know us. They know both what we were like before we knew Jesus and they can see the growing holiness in our lives. Jesus challenged this man to stay, to stay where speaking out what Jesus had done and living day in, day out was likely to be uncomfortable. But in doing that, he could point to the transformational power of an encounter with Jesus. So as we go into the world, let's live lives that declare his good works, his grace and his transforming power to the world around us. When it's hard, when we struggle, when others are watching, because we point to the one who is worthy of our following. Let's pray together. Father, challenge us in our everyday lives to live for you. We pray that we would be the fragrance of Christ to those in our circles, Christian and non-Christian alike, that through the lives we live, we would show you and your eternal loving kindness, faithfulness and grace to those around us in our actions and words. Be with us this week, we pray. Prod us to action in those simple everyday moments and challenge us to continue imprinting the image of your son, Jesus Christ, on our lives, in our everyday. Amen.